percentage of people that actually follow through on their New Year's resolutions? What do you think it is? Five, okay, you get your close. It's, it's 8%, actually, is what, what statistics say. So 8% of the people that make them actually carry them out for the full year. Uh, yeah, so there's a, you know, some of us will make it, but most of us probably not. Um, this New Year's, though, this time, especially between Christmas and New Year's for a lot of us, is a good time to, to reflect on things that need a, a bit more perspective and a little longer range than maybe, maybe just a week or a month might give us. And, and sometimes maybe we'll sit down and think about maybe finances or we'll sit down and think about um, goals or we'll sit down and think about even our own spiritual life. And we probably even ask questions like, you know, where am I compared to where I was a year ago? Like in my relationship with God, have I moved forward or am I about the same or have I even moved backwards in some way? And, and these, these are, are questions that, that take that broader perspective. You can't really, a week or a month isn't enough time. It takes like a year to really see a trajectory like that. And it's good to take inventory of that because we can do something about it. And a lot of those things are actually within our power to do. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about values and about how values are the things that drive our behaviors, actually. Uh, at our Savior Lutheran Church, we actually have six core values that we, we say are important to us. We value being true to God's Word because God's Word is true. We value being in a personal relationship with Jesus. We value, value living life on mission. We value making truth relevant. We value fostering a culture of belonging, and we value living generously. Now, that living generously, we actually just did a whole sermon series on that, so we're not going to talk about that one uh, today. And, and uh, we're actually, starting next week, we're going we're to talk about that value of living life on mission. That's going to be actually our next sermon series is about that. And, and we, we've also talked a bit about making truth relevant, but actually that's kind of a sermon series coming up during this series, uh, the season of Lent addresses that. So we're really going to just look at three values today. Uh, and, and they're not values that are just meant for us collectively as the body of Christ, but they're also things that are important to us individually. And there's a sheet in your bulletin that, that looks something like this. It's a two-sided thing. I'd love for you to take that out. We're only going to look at one side of it today because uh, one side of it has the three values on it we're going to talk about, and the other side has those other ones we're not going to talk about today. And these are some questions. We're not going to go through them right now, but, but if, if you're part of a life group, these are, these are kind of questions that we would go through in, in that kind of a setting, or maybe there are even some questions you want to think about and ask yourself uh, how you're living out these values. So you want to make sure that you're looking at the side that says true to God's word, uh, culture, belonging, and relationship with Jesus at the top. That's, that's the side we're going to be looking at today because that's those three values that we're going to be talking about today. All right, so before we do that, though, how many of you, um, like, grew up in a Lutheran church and went to confirmation? All right, so you remember Luther's small catechism and having to memorize things, right? And, and you might remember there's a question that came up, like, every time this came up. And by the way, if you don't know what that is, uh, the small catechism is like a, uh, it's like a basics of the faith thing that, was, that, that covers uh, the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, and the Lord's Prayer. But it doesn't just tell you what they are. It actually says, here's what it means. And so you have, like, one line and then a paragraph explaining what it means. And a lot of us had to memorize that. And because we had to do it, we're making our junior hires do it today, too. <laughs> there's more to it than that, though. And, and there's this question that would come up. Like, after you would read, like, the first commandment, say, like, what does this mean? Right? And, and, and that, there would be this explanation to that. And it's, it's a great question to ask. What does this mean? And there was another question that was something like, how is this done? Or the way that we're, we're, we're talking about today is, what does this look like? And we're going we're gonna to break down these three values today and really just, just ask these, these two questions about each one of them. What does this actually mean? And what does it look like to live this out? What does it look like in a very practical way? And so the first of these is being true to God's word. Being true to God's word. This is the, the, the first value for us. It's, it's first for a reason because this becomes foundational to everything else that we do and how we understand who we are as a people of God. And, 
And there's a number of verses that speak to this, but, but one in particular is this. Would you read it with me? All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So let's think about why we value Scripture the way we do. Because we, we actually give it quite a bit of a, an authority as a follower of Jesus as to what, what it means to speak into our lives and, and, and even to, to govern our lives by it. And, and when we say we, we value God's Word, we're true to God's Word, we're saying we believe that, that the Bible is the Word of God. Now, there are some churches that will say it differently. They'll say the Bible contains the Word of God. But we don't say it that way because when you, when you say it contains the Word of God, Usually they say it also contains other things that aren't the Word of God. And we, we don't like to say it that way. We like to say that it, it is the Word of God, that all of it. And what that means to us is that this is, is a word that is spoken by God who has a perspective that we don't have, that no one else has. Uh, God who says, I see eternity. I, I'm, the, I'm the ancient of days. I created the world. I created people. I can see the future. I can see the consequences of your action. I know how people were meant to operate, and I know what it looks like to have a relationship with God. And, and it's this God that says, I, I even know the struggles that, you're, that are going on in the year 2017 and 2018. I, I, I've seen ahead to that. And the amazing thing is, is there's a God that when he spoke thousands of years ago, he knew all that, he took it all into account and said, these are words of life. These are words that, that will give you wisdom beyond yourself. These are, these are timeless words that apply across the board. Now, how many of you have friends that can speak with that kind of wisdom? Or what about from a talk show? Can you get that kind of wisdom? I mean, this isn't a category all by itself, is it? There, there, there's nowhere else that we can turn where, where there's, there's that kind of wisdom, that kind of life-giving word that's available to us. This is why we say it has authority over us. And this is why we even submit ourselves to the word of God. Have you ever found something in the Bible that maybe you didn't like what it said? Yeah, right? We, we, we probably have. It makes us uncomfortable. We wish we didn't say that. And, and, and there are, and this, this will change from person to person. It even varies from culture to culture. For instance, um, just think about this. So in our culture, if, if uh, we were to look at Jesus teaching about love your enemies, you know, our, our culture would go, well, that sounds really good. That's, that's good. But then we would ask in the broader culture, what about, what about the Bible's view of sexual ethics? And they go, well, that seems kind of old-fashioned, right? I mean, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a little old. But now you go to the Middle East, and you ask those same questions. You know, what do you, what do you think about what Jesus says about loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you? They say, that's impossible. Nobody can live that way. You get destroyed. But then you ask, well, what do you think about the Bible's sexual ethics? They go, well, it seems about right. Uh, maybe a little too loose for, for us. We, we'd like something a little more tightened up about that. And, and it, it just changes from culture to culture. Different people will, will actually push back against God's word in different ways. But we believe that it's that timeless perspective, that eternal word of God. And even when we find ourselves pushing back against it, the problem isn't the word of God. The problem is us. And we seek to let it speak into our lives. And so that's what we mean by it. So what, what does it actually look like to live this out, to, to, let it, to let it have authority in our lives? It has a lot to do with how we make decisions. So let me ask you, the last big decision you made, how much did Scripture play a part in that? Maybe it's stuff you had memorized and, and you just kind of knew that these are principles of God or verses, or, or maybe did you even look something up or was that not even a thought? Or, or maybe even just an afterthought after things went wrong. I, I'm not sure. But sometimes that's how it plays out for us, doesn't it? And we want it to be authoritative in our life. We want it to speak into our decision-making. 
You know, there was a, a study about 10 or 12 years ago. It was called the Reveal Study. This, uh, the Gallup organization did it along with a, a really large church, and now like tens of thousands of churches have participated. And, and it found something that was really interesting but really simple. It said that no matter where people are at on their spiritual journey, whether they're kind of just starting out or they're, they're well-seasoned, their walk of faith, there were two things more than anything else that helped people grow in their relationship with God and in their spiritual journey. It was daily scripture reading and daily prayer. Those two things, regardless of where you were, they help people move forward in that way. And, and I go, that it's, it sounds so simple, but it's really not common because for a lot of us, this may look more like the story, right? And and this is something maybe as we're thinking about New Year's and maybe some things that we could do different and, and maybe head life on a different trajectory so that especially when we look back a year from now, we'll say, you know, I've moved forward in my relationship with God. I, I, I'm, I'm positively in a different place than I was a year ago. And so God's word is something we value, but it's also something that we want to internalize in that. Now, another value is a culture of belonging. Right, people want to belong, and a lot of times when we think about scripture uh, and, and God, we go, it's, it's this vertical relationship, you know, me and God, me and God, and that's very important. But Christianity is is unique in, in that it also cares a lot about this horizontal relationships, how we treat other people, and it, it's huge as part of that. God cares a lot about that, and, and this that's what we're talking about here. And there's a, there's a number of places scriptures speak to this, but let's, let's read this verse together. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Did you see any words in that verse that, that maybe speak to human relationships on that horizontal level? Maybe things like humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, right? Unity, bond of peace. Those all impact the, the horizontal relationships, don't they? They do. And, and the Bible is full of things that speak to this. And, and the Bible is also full of a lot of those one another's. Did you know that there are over 70 of those in Scripture? Like love one another, pray for one another, you know, um, bear one another's burdens. There's, there's 70 of them. Some of them are repeats. But when you think about that, how many people at a minimum does it take to do it one another? Hold up your fingers. It's two, right? I mean, it, it takes at least two to do it one another, right? And, and what that means is that, that Christianity can never be like a solo act. It's not meant to be that. There are things that do have to do with you and your relationship with God, but, there, but it can't be just that. It actually, it, it involves other people. It involves a body of Christ. It involves um, loving them as, as God loves them. When you look at Scripture and you see the, the word you come up, Y-O-U, in English, we, we don't differentiate between the singular and plural, do we? It, it looks the same. We have to tell by context what's being spoken about. Uh, unless you're in the South and then you get y'all and you get, you get extra words like that. But, but most of us people, we, we don't have that. And, and, and so we're, we're stuck sometimes reading the, this verse, maybe not knowing uh, verses like that, that mention you, maybe not even understanding, is it, is it speaking about me or, or all of us? Most of the time in Scripture, the you is plural. But when you live in an individualistic culture like ours, what do we tend to read it as? Singular, don't we? We tend to just assume that's what it is. But most of the time, it's probably a plural when you read it in God's Word. It's something that encompasses all of us together, relationship-wise. Would you read this next verse with me? All right, I need some help. All right. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Rejoice in hope. 
Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. And seek to show hospitality. So once again, you know, another whole idea of what it means to, to have a relationship with people. And, and then there's that word at the bottom, hospitality. I, I think this is, is something that's sort of becoming a lost art uh, in our culture today. Any of you remember how maybe it was a little bit different where you grew up, where it used to be like okay to just show up at a neighbor's house? Like, do you, anybody, anybody ever live in a place like that? I remember when you were kids, it was just kind of normal and expected. Would you do that today unannounced? No, we wouldn't, right? I mean, it's just, it would be considered culturally inappropriate to do that today because things have changed. But uh, along with that change in culture, maybe we've lost something. And, and a lot of that is the ability to invite others in. And, and when we say a, a culture of belonging or, or, or this, this kind of that skill of hospitality, how do we welcome people in? How do we let someone who feels like they're on the outside, how do we help them come in? How do we help let them feel like they belong? That, that's what we mean by that. And, and, and there's specific things that we can do that allow that to happen. Most of us, and I, I include myself in this category, have a tendency to kind of focus on our own thing. And, and what happens, though, is we're, we're kind of looking right in front of us, and what's that next step I need to take? And the problem with that is when I'm looking in front of me, I'm not necessarily looking up. And that means I, I might not see other people. To, to, have, to create a culture of belonging, to have practice hospitality, it actually takes an intentional looking up. And it actually takes an intentional caring about other people. And, and for some of us, we're, we're wired more in our personalities to do that. For others of us, it's, it's a bigger jump and a, and a leap. But what it comes down to, no matter what, it, it's setting aside our own preferences and our own self-interest and maybe even our own comfort in order to invite the outsider in the person who feels lonely, the person who feels like, like maybe they, they don't have a friend, or the person who feels like they, 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 just, they're not, they wouldn't fit in, they would never be invited into that. But it takes people noticing. It takes people looking up enough to see that there's someone who, who needs to be invited into that. Now, this is probably simpler than you thought. A lot of times it's just inviting people into what you're already doing. It might be inviting people to go to the grocery store. You probably never thought it was all that exciting, so you would never bother doing that. <laughs> but there are people that are sometimes just looking for a friend and looking for some interaction, and they might want to come along. Or maybe you're baking, and maybe they've never had anyone show them how to do that before, and they'd love to just come and participate. Or maybe you're going fishing, and you say... Well, sure, you could come along with me. Because essentially what this is, is just inviting other people in to what we're already doing. That's what it is. Uh, because a lot of people are just waiting for that invitation. But for, for a lot of us, we have to be intentional about that. Because what we want people to feel is that I belong. And that, that, that's as a, as a church, but it's also at an individual level and as a family. You know, do, do, we, do we exhibit that? Is that something we value? Because it's through relationship most of the time that we ultimately point people to Jesus. And finally, this, this last value that, that we're talking about today is a personal relationship with Jesus. Have you ever heard uh, the phrase or seen a t-shirt or bumper sticker that says it's, it's a relationship, not a religion? Anybody ever heard that before? All right. So for those of us that may not have heard that or don't know what that means, we mean that, that Christianity is fundamentally different than any other, other, other religion that's out there. Because re religion is something that, that tries to, to earn favor with God by you doing the right things. And so you keep commandments, or, or, or you, you be good, or you try not to be bad, and, and you just try to balance out the scales or something like that, or try to make it so God loves you, or you somehow earn heaven, or whatever equivalent of that happens to be in that religion. That, that's, that's what a religion does. But a relationship says it's really more about love and who you know. 
And, and this is where Christianity is very different. And, and we'll explain that Christianity ha- looks similar in some ways because it does do good things, but it does them for a very different reason than every other faith. And uh, let, let's, let's talk about why that is. Would you read this first verse with me? And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. So if we were to look at that verse, and we had to figure out who makes the first move in this love relationship with God, is it God or is it us? It's God, right? It's God. And and this is so important for us to recognize. God is the one who makes the first move. God is the one who does that. And when you think about what it means that, that he emptied himself, that he took on flesh and blood, that he came to this earth and, and became the very lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, he, he took our debt of sin upon himself. He did all of that so that you could be his. And he did all of that before you were ever born before you ever had any chance to try to show them that you were worth it, because you can't do that anyway. Before you had any chance to do that, your, your destiny was already sealed in that way. That he said, I, I'm going to die for your sins, for all those things that you've done, past, present, future, everything you've done to, against God, everything you've done to hurt other people, all of that, he says, I'm going to put on my son for you, and he's going to pay the penalty in your place. That, that's part of that first move that God does. And, and, and what we do is a response to that, that there's a God who loves you regardless of your performance, and he says that there's one thing I want back from you more than anything else. Let's, let's read what that is with me. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your strength, with, oh, with all your strength. You know, Jesus uh, said this in the context where someone said, you know, what's the greatest commandment? You know, there's 613 in the Old Testament. Which one's the, the greatest? He says this one. And he said, you combine this with love your neighbor as yourself, and you have basically summed up the whole Bible. The rest is commentary on that. Love God, love people. That's, that's, why that's, that's part of our, our mission statement. We love God, love people. We live like Jesus. It sums up what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And, and what this means to us is that, that a personal relationship with Jesus, it, it starts with God, but then this is what God says he wants back. More than anything else, he wants your love. He wants all of your love. Now, when you see that about your you know, loving God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, um, what, what is left out of that? Not much, right? I mean, it's pretty much everything. This is loving God with everything you have. That's what this is, to, to just love him back. A few weeks ago, we used this example from... Um, uh, from Romans 12, where, where Paul talked about living your life like a, like a living sacrifice, of offering yourself up. And we said what, what that meant was your life becomes like a love note to God, that, that we're, the way that we live, the things that we do, become a response back to saying thank you to God. And this is so different than doing things to try to earn approval to God. God makes the first move. He says, I love you, you're mine, you're forgiven, I want you to be part of my family. And, and he says, what I, what I hope you'll do is just love me back. That's what I hope you'll do. And, and, and it's going to look different. It's going to take a different shape in each person's life. And what this could mean is, like, let's just say that, that um, you and I were, uh, next, in a couple of weeks, we're going to go work at Faith in Action. All right, we're going to go do that. And we're going to go change some breaks for people. It's a big stretch for both of us, probably. <laughs> And there, while there are some people that fix cars, there are other people like us that just work on cars. And, and, and we're going to go and, and we're going to do this. But, but he, the only difference is we're working on the same car, different wheels or whatever. But I'm going there with this thing um, in my mind. I'm going, you know, I've really messed up these last few weeks and I, I kind of need to do something to 
you know, earn some favor from God. I kind of need to make up for some of the bad things that I've done. So if I, if I go and do these things, uh, uh, that, that should do it. And, and maybe, you know, me and God will be okay after that. And then you're there saying, you know, um, yeah, yeah, I mess up. But, but I know there's a God who loves me. I stand forgiven. And I do this simply because I love him. This is an expression of my love back for God. And I do it by loving people in the name of Jesus. Same outward action but entirely different things going on on the inside. I'm doing it for religion. I'm doing it because I'm trying to, trying to earn something, I'm trying to fix a problem, but you're doing it because you love God. And you're saying, this is what it looks like when I do that. This is how I live that out. And, and the same outward action produces very different things when people approach it in those different ways. You ever notice that Jesus loved to be around people? And he loved to teach people what it meant to have a relationship with God. The very relational guy. And, and more than anything, he wants us to have a relationship with him. Those two practices we spoke about a little bit ago, like daily scripture reading and daily prayer, they, they don't just help your spiritual life they also build your relationship with Jesus. They do that because it's his word and we're talking with him. And if, if there were a couple of practices that, that maybe we could restart in our life or, or maybe take to the next level, these would be things that would, would bear fruit in our lives and produce good things. And, and, and they would allow us to say, you know, even though I had this line where kind of from one year to the next, it was kind of, kind of the same spot spiritually, 2018, when I look back, that was the year that things began to grow because I put some new practices in my life. I, I, I tried to align my behaviors with the things that, that I value. My hope for you, dear friends in Christ, is that you would value God's word. Let us speak authoritatively into your life. That you would seek to create a culture of belonging within the body of Christ and as an individual, welcoming in the outsider. And that you would seek to have that personal relationship with Jesus where you love him above all else. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for not only being the God of the universe, a God who created all things, but a God who cares about the details of our lives, a God who even invites us to call him Father. What an amazing thing that is. And so, Lord, we, we come to you as your beloved sons and daughters and, and, and just ask that you would um, intervene on behalf of ourselves and, and those that we know and love. Lord, we pray for those that are, are mourning the loss of loved ones. We pray for your peace and your strength and your comfort. And for those of us that walk alongside them, give us wisdom in our words and our compassion. Father, for those that are struggling in their bodies, whether battling disease or recovering from surgeries, we pray you as the great physician would, would enter in and, and just uh, provide what you know is good and bring your love and your mercy to bear on each situation. Lord, we pray for the brokenhearted, for those who are struggling in relationships and and, Lord, we just pray that you would heal them. And, Lord, where there's something we need to do different, we pray that, um, Lord, you just make that apparent in our lives as well. Father, we thank you for family gatherings and uh, the things that we're able to enjoy and to celebrate. And, and we just uh, praise you for that. Thank you for those good things. And we, we pray that, that we would, even those things, would be a, a culture of belonging where we can invite um, our family and others into that. And finally, Lord, we pray for this upcoming year that, that above all else, that we would seek first your kingdom and seek to love you with all our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's join the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
We're going to continue our worship now by presenting our tithes and offerings to our Lord. And uh, you're going to get me today for announcements as part of that. So uh, the very first thing we'd love for you to do is to fill out your...